Hi Janesville, welcome back to Park Place Views, brought to you by the City of Janesville and JATV Media Services. I'm your host, Molly Nolte, and I'm the Management Information Specialist in the City Manager's Office. This monthly program aims to keep Janesville residents informed by highlighting the people, places, events, and partners in the City of Janesville. Of course, as you may have noticed, this program has been on hiatus for the last several months due to COVID-19. And while the City coordinated its response to the pandemic, Many non-essential programs like this one and other services went on hold. So I'm pleased to welcome you all back to the JETV studio. We last spoke all the way back in March when I caught up with Hedberg Public Library's director, Brian McCormick, who walked us through HPL's recent renovations and redesign. If you're interested in reviewing past episodes of Park Place Views, they're available to watch on the city's website or JETV's YouTube channel. Today, I'm really looking forward to having a great conversation with Janesville Fire Department's Fire Chief, Ernie Rhodes. And typically, I would talk to Chief about the Fire Department itself, but this interview will be a little bit unique. We're going to take an in-depth look into the City of Janesville's response to the COVID-19 global pandemic at the local level. And while Chief Rhodes has been maintaining his service to both the Janesville and Milton Fire Departments as their chief, he has ultimately been serving the city as our incident commander for the pandemic response and I'll explain what that means in a moment. The city of Janesville was fortunate to have Chief Rhodes here when the pandemic hit because he has a great deal of experience responding to emergencies across the country. He has a career in fire services and a career in emergency management. Thank you for being here, Chief Rhodes. Hey, good morning, Molly. Thanks for having me. Good morning. I know you've been so busy lately, so it really means a lot that you took the time this morning to sit down and talk to me. Wonderful. So I've got some questions I'd like to ask you, and first I'd just like to say, you know, what an unprecedented time in our city, in our country, you know, across the world, um, globally. So I, I, I probably know the answer to this question, but have you ever seen anything like this before? So uh, not so widespread. Uh, I think, you know, what's interesting is that our infrastructure is still in place, but our society is shut down, which has caused uh, the cascading events for those. And it's created a lot of apprehension and anxiety in our communities across the United States. It's impacted our you know, financial uh, capability to earn a living. So, uh, no, I've not seen anything like this, no. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> I talked a little bit about your experience early, earlier on, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about your experience as an inc incident commander and kind of what you did or, or have done for um, the FEMA or the National Incident Management Structure in the country? Sure. So uh, as far as uh, FEMA Urban Search and Rescue, I've been, uh, I've been on a, uh, started on Missouri Task Force 1, which is one of 28 federal USAR teams um, in uh, 2000, and, or 2000, in 2000. And I started there as a, uh, a rescue specialist assigned to a squad. And then through the years, I've been promoted up to rescue squad officer, rescue team manager. I'm currently now a task force leader for Missouri Task Force One, and then subsequently as, um, as the system grows and as opportunities come, uh, I decided to, that I wanted to be a part of one of the three uh, command teams for the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue System. And so uh, I um, you know, applied, it's a, it's a competitive application, and uh, came on as a, uh, a division supervisor and then uh, worked up my way to Operations Section Chief, which is what I am now, I'm an operations section chief, not the incident commander. So um, yeah, it's been amazing. It's been such a career opportunity, but it's been amazing to meet uh, men and women across the United States that are literally the best of the best, which uh, it, we are so blessed to have these people. And But to be able to go to 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, mudslides in, in Washington, the catastrophic flash flooding in Colorado, every hurricane probably since 2000 uh, just about I've been deployed to either as on a rescue team or at, on a task force or uh, in, in, on the uh, incident uh, support team the command team so I'm able to come into or go into communities that have been devastated uh, and I've been able to identify through the years what what's going to break or what has broken and how to fix it and uh, so I've been able to just pull all that experience together uh, right now, in I guess my ripe old age of 55, uh, and and to bring that to really the city of Janesville. So. Absolutely. Well, we're very grateful that you have all that ex experience and you've been able to bring that to Janesville. And I should mention, everything that you just talked about that you've done, that's been 
concurrent with your job in fire services yes. too. You know, you've been a fire chief meanwhile and yes. maintaining all that service. So um, wearing a few hats there, Chief. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, I, for the for the national command team, um, I'm on call every third month. And uh, then, you know, when I get activated, I be I'm, you know, deployed and assigned. And, you know, uh, basically at the city of Janesville, I'll take, a, uh, you know, a administrative leave without pay when I deploy. Uh, and then I become assigned to the team or to the system. And I work for the federal government until they release me. And it's usually f about 14 days maximum. So Wonderful. Well, um, some people may know this, but some people may not. During the local response to COVID here in Janesville, we did activate our emergency operations center, and we call that uh, the EOC. And that's, of course, what you've been the incident commander of, um, the EOC. So some people might not know a whole lot about that. Um, can you kind of walk us through what an EOC really does and what happens when we activate it? So in the city of Janesville, through, throughout the years of um, City Manager Freitag's, you know, efforts and resolve to build an emergency operations center physically, but also to train the staff, has really put Janesville in a really proactive position. Uh, when, and, and so what the emergency operations center is, it's a group of employees that come together and they serve in various capacities to manage the emergency. You have a logistics section, you have an operations section, you have a um, uh, planning section, and then you have your finance admin section, and then you also have safety officer, public information officer, which that's what you do, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you have a liaison officer to inter interface with all of the other agencies in our community that may need, uh, we may need to partner up with them during a disaster. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts here. I've really made it sound simple, but uh, the EOC is basically the nerve center for the city when the d a disaster occurs. And we organize ourselves using the incident, the National Incident Command System, which is the only way to run an emergency. But what we do is we set objectives. And based on those objectives, we assign resources to those objectives. And so when we're done, at, so and then once we assign those, we build an incident action plan that says what everybody's doing during the emergency. Like, wh what are you doing? Who do you work for? Where are you going to work? And how do you talk to your boss? Those are four of the th biggest things to get an emer to, to run through an emergency to prevent uh, misinformation, uh, duplication in efforts, understand what your assignment is, and then and then not to um, to have a really good span of control that that you can control all these moving parts because if one person did it we would fail because we're just overwhelmed. So you have to break it down. We use our emergency operations center to do that. It's kind of a hybrid function. Normally an EOC is just to support the response and logistics, uh, information, public warning, et cetera. But here in Janesville, we actually use it as our command post too, which works out really well because we're not only building our incident action plan, but then everybody in the city knows what that plan is. And we brief that plan every day and share that plan so everybody knows what their assignment is. Right, absolutely. Yep. And you've already kind of talked about some of those other roles that are within the EOC. Um, so when we activate it, you know, you become incident commander. You mentioned I become the public information officer, and I, I kind of have my team of people too. So um, just to stress, you know, these are staff people. These are city employees yeah. who are coming in, kind of taking their city hat off, putting on their EOC hat, and going forward and responding in that way. Right. Absolutely. So <clears throat> you've mentioned uh, a lot about the, the different types of calls that you've gone on. You responded to 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, and so on. Um, and you've worked in this capacity all over the country. Um, so in terms of the way Janesville's EOC functions, how can you say we kind of stack up in terms of um, our EOC compared to others uh, across the country that you've seen? So I, I've been to many communities to where you would, uh, big cities that, um, larger cities than bigger than Janesville and you would think to be highly organized and and I would say that I would stack Janesville up to many many large cities because we're using the incident command system we're building an incident action plan we're using objectives to stay out of the weeds uh, and assigning the resources that to get them done to get those tasks done and then moving on to the next pro the, the next problem so I, I would I am impressed I am very comfortable with what the city's done and really proud of the staff that everybody has to transition from their full-time job to another full-time job. So 
I, I think it's highly competent emergency operations center, and I would pit it against uh, many other large EOCs, even some state EOCs, absolutely. Well, that's great to hear, and I really hope that the community of Janesville feels comfortable, too, knowing that, you know, that's the structure that we've got going behind the scenes. So, good. Uh, Chief, early on in the pandemic, the state of Wisconsin and many other communities declared states of emergency, uh, and Janesville did the same. Um, it sounds a little scary, you know, because it has the word emergency in it. But really, what what does that mean when we when we declare a state of emergency? Well, I think I think it's it's supposed to allow um, our government to function under emergency operation. It gives uh, the city manager, uh, in our in our case, the city manager, uh, the ability to make decisions that may impact life and safety. That normally you may have a a, 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 procure, a procurement process or a legislative process you have to go through. And we simply don't have the time for that. Um, so I think that's that's a really important thing. Also, it's necessary to uh, declare a state of emergency that we start the process of going through the county. The county goes through the state. The state goes through the federal government for a federal declaration, which helps offset some of the cost of our responses. Right, absolutely. So maintaining such a long operational period um, as we've had to do since March, really, we've been responding to COVID-19. Um, and while we maintain such a long-standing operational period, uh, it, of course, has financial implications. And you kind of just touched on that a little bit. Um, so in addition to the state of emergency, how has Janesville been preparing to financially bounce back from COVID? So I think, uh, so, you know, thank goodness the federal government has uh, created uh, funding to states and states therefore push the funding down to the local uh, uh, local municipalities and, and units of government, but routes to recovery is a great example to where we will capture the funding back uh, that we spent on the COVID-19. And, and you got to remember the, the the funding that we're the things that we're spending on is for protective action and life-saving action. Um, that is the criteria. If it doesn't meet that criteria, then it doesn't qualify for funding. Nor would we buy it, right? Because we're, it is an emergency operation, and we're focused on deterring the spread of COVID-19 and making sure we're prepared to um, uh, deal with it on an ongoing basis. So that's, that's one way. Obviously, uh, FEMA's uh, public assistance grant for uh, Category B, which is a protective action too for life safety, is another aspect where uh, we would submit for a reimbursement. Um, we would pay approximately 12.5% because the state, let me back up here, the federal government during a federal disaster uh, declaration uh, We'll cover 75% of the cost if it fits into, uh, oh my gosh, there's probably eight or nine categories, but category B is, A and B is really primarily when the disaster hits and we want to get our community back operating again and we want to do life-saving measures and protective measures. And so they'll pay 75% of that cost. The state of Wisconsin will cover up 12 and a half, pick up the 12 and a half percent, and then Janesville would be responsible for the next 12 and a half percent. So so we do, you know, we do have routes of uh, recovering our costs. I'm very confident that we're going to get a large, large majority of our costs covered. But once again, I want to emphasize these costs are for life-saving measures. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for walking us through that. I, I think the financial side is complicated, so uh, it's nice to have a little bit of a breakdown. Um, so let's talk about kind of more of a local response again. So after the pandemic hit, um, you know, police and fire they're really on the front lines of this a lot of the time. Um, how do you think that their operations changed in the last four months or so? Well, I think, um, so I, I can speak really about the, the fire side because we have the paramedic, paramedic program we do at EMS. And it's, you know, we're, we're definitely on the front line and we're having the face-to-face -face interaction with p people that are potentially uh, infected by COVID-19. And so... I started watching this probably in January, uh, watching what was going on in China. You know, somebody once said in disaster, you know, watch what they're doing, not what they're saying. And when they shut down a city of 11 million, a hard shutdown, I'm like, something's not right here. So I started looking at that. And, and I know myself and um, uh, the staff were talking about it. We were starting to order PPE, anticipating uh, what, what was coming. And uh, unfortunately, we were right. Uh, so, so this caused us to really look at the virus, adapt CDC guidelines, decontamination protocols, contamination protocols, 
make sure our people had the PPE to protect themselves and, and train them on that. And it was a lot of, uh, a lot of change in the first few weeks of COVID-19 when it finally made landfall here in our community. And we were changing protocols sometimes two and three times daily based on good information. Right. And so that changed our operation significantly because that was the focus, that was the threat. Although we were still running fires and vehicle accidents and medical emergencies, but we had to assume that everybody we came in contact with had COVID-19. And there were many, there's, there's been many occasions where our folks would go to like somebody that had a very minor uh, medical emergency and they get on the scene. And of course our firefighters and paramedics had their PPE on and they took them to the hospital and they got a call that the person was COVID-19. Thank goodness we all wore our stuff. We were prepared. So, so we really worked very hard to prepare our people. I think we're, I know we're ahead of the game. Uh, so just the COVID-19 of the new protocols, the new training, what to do, when to decontaminate. We set up a decontamination bay. We decontaminate our engines or ambulances. I think that's a big, that's, that's a big transition because when we normally respond to a communicable disease, like let's say TB, our folks are trained in communicable disease. It's not a big deal. But, you know, we get in. They Usually the person says, I got TB. You put your stuff on. You're good. Come back. Get cleaned up. Take a shower. Clean the ambulance. Not a big deal. Call's over. Moving on, right? Next call comes in. Could be a, a, a heart attack. You're going in. You don't have to really worry about gowning up and wearing your N95 and your face shields and all that. So it was just, it was just a really short operational blip. Now this is every day. Every day. So the, every call. And, you know, and then... I, I think, and not to, to speak for Chief Moore, but the police too, I mean, their interaction with the public is they have to assume that, you know, it's communal spread and so they have to protect themselves. And I think it's, it's adjusted their protocols too, the face mask, you know, and I know the police officers are decontaminating their cruisers like daily, daily, multiple times. And so that's probably a, a drain on uh, the officers too, but you know, I, I look at, I talk to our folks, you know, all the time and, and they're doing really good, but um, it, I think it's starting to wear on everybody, but, but you have to find the innovation. You have to find the fact, I, I hate saying, well, it's our new norm. I hate, I don't like that. I, have, I, I want our folks to say, how can we integrate this into our everyday response plan? And so we're working on that and we've done that. So Absolutely. it's been a big change. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yep. And you, you kind of just um, started talking about it too, but in terms of how people have been feeling, you know, city staff, EOC staff, police and fire, you know, everyone's pretty stretched, <laughs> pretty stretched th thin and feeling a little bit stressed out. And certainly the same can be said for the community. Very stressful time, very emotional time for the community. Um, and because we've never dealt with anything like this, um, you know, it's been difficult for people to manage. So, um, you know, that whole new normal thing that everyone's been talking about. Do you have a message for the folks who might be struggling with that new normal? Well, I do, right? So from my years of experience in responding to disasters, uh, I've learned it through other, other mentors in national response and people that I really respect, when people get tired and they get stressed, you know, they may not act accordingly. They're, they're trying to find their way through the disaster. And I always say, give each other grace, right? And so, and be flexible. And I think, I think we have to do that. We have to continue to do that. I mean, we have another stressor put on our community and that's, do our kids go back to school or not? Our parents are stressed, our kids are stressed. And so everybody has to take a deep breath and go, okay, we're all stressed out here. How do I give, how do I give myself grace? How do I, how do I not get too wound up so I can think clearly, take a deep breath, our kids grace, our neighbors grace, our community grace. And, and I always say, too, to do one positive thing a day. When we're going through this, just one positive thing will move you forward. It will move you forward through uh, the process. And from my experience of, of disaster response, just, just going out of your way to, to, be, to make sure you're saying hi to somebody that's on the front line or it's in your command, it, it, that's in the command team or the incident management team with you, and making sure that they feel... Um, that you're paying attention and that you care about them, mm -hmm. it's huge. And I think, you know, give grace, one positive thing, and, and honestly love each other, right? God, we have to. Yep. And what a unique thing, I think, that, you know, 
it's not just in Janesville or Wisconsin or even our country. It's the whole world. So it's kind of, I think, w one of the most unique things about the pandemic itself is everyone on the planet is all going yep. through this together, Very which yeah. is the scary part of it, but it's kind of the amazing thing about it, too, because we're, we're really all walking the same walk right now. We are. We are. And, and you, know, we'll, you know, I think we will get through this. I think if we wear our masks and we wash our hands, uh, we will thrive in this environment. If you look through the, the history of mankind, we've always adapted and always have changed uh, for the better, I think. And, and here's just another opportunity to do that. But it's not easy. Yep. It's not easy. Yep. But we will get through it. Yep. So speaking of face masks, and you were talking earlier about PPE, which is personal protective equipment. Um, since the CDC passed down that guidance of wearing face masks um, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, the city got on board right away, and we've been pushing that message and encouraging everyone to wear their face masks, practice social distancing, washing hands, taking those other safety measures. Um, and some people, you know, disagree with the face mask wearing um, idea. So while it's a little bit controversial, let's talk about that a little bit. What message would you give folks who, who don't want to wear a mask? So, and I've probably said this a lot on our community briefs, but here's how the virus travels and this is how it, it infects you Molly and me uh, it's it's airborne so I breathe it in okay and it's it can get on my hands and I can eat or rub my face which we rub our face a lot during the day and I can ingest it that's how it enters the body um, for the most part and obviously the eyes too uh, if you really want to get technical um, you can have a droplet on your eyes but uh, for the most part the two major routes are ingestion and inhalation Wearing a mask prevents me uh, from coughing and putting uh, the, the, the virus in the air so that you can breathe it. Wearing a mask prevents me from coughing and it lands on the chair and the next guest comes in or somebody moves the chair and has the virus on their hands and has a snack, right? So the mask is huge. And, and if you look at, if you look at, um, the CDC guidance, and you look at the research that's out there that says it does make a difference. It's a barrier. It is no difference than as we're taught to cough in your elbow to prevent the spread of a cold or flu. It's exactly what this is doing for us. So that's a big deal. And then just clean your hands. Chief, this may be kind of a hard question to answer, but in your professional opinion, where do you see the city of Janesville in the next three to six months? So I see us, the short answer is uh, to continuously monitor uh, the spread of the virus to be prepared to increase the level of operation in the city for emergency operations uh, center. I see our protocols that are in place right now. I don't think we need to change those. Uh, I see us, you know, continue to wear our masks, uh, clean our hands, social distance. Um, and I think we're just, we're going to monitor it and we're going to find ways to, uh, you know, evaluate our current operations. Um, City Manager Freitag does that with us on a very regular basis to constantly reevaluate. Matter of fact, we do it every week. Where are we at? What are we doing? Uh, where are we going? You know, are, are, you, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right things right? You know, and um, uh, so we do that. And so I just see us monitoring it and just our current, our current response uh, stance right now. I don't see it changing for three to six months. Definitely. So uh, it'll still be here for sure. Oh, for sure. With uh, I think it, without a doubt. Are there any resources that you can offer the community as we continue to fight the pandemic at the local level? So I think uh, if you need resources, the state of Wisconsin has a great website, the Department of Health, COVID-19. I would go there and you can get resources for uh, uh, mental, mental care, uh, medical care. Uh, there's some really good information on how to deal with the stress of this change. I think that's real important. I think our website has, has just as much good information. Uh, if you need help getting a mask, uh, I think you can, you can get a hold of uh, Blackhawk 211 and they'll help you get a mask. Um, and I think just listen, keep, keep uh, your situational awareness and listen to, the lo listen to you know, what we're saying for the city because we're passing along valid, true information. And I think information is very powerful and having the knowledge of what is right, what is real, what is not real. I think that's your biggest resources is knowing really what's going on. 
And Chief, kind of closing out here, do you have a final message that you'd like to leave our community? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I, I really do think that the virus is going to be around for, I remember when we started in March, I said it's going to be around till October. Well, I think it's going to be around for a while, right? I, I hear a year, I hear two years, and I would say that's probably right. The good news is, is I think we as a community can thrive. I think we're going to find ways to get back to some sort of business as best as we can. I think they're going to be centric around wearing a mask, social distancing, and washing your hands. And, and I just, I'm positive. I have a positive um, outlook on that, and we'll, we'll get through it. So once again, I would say, you know, it's so important because we're, you know, Molly, as you said, the whole planet is stressed out right now, right? So, so on, a, on a small level, if you can give yourself grace, your family grace, your neighbor, um, slow, you know, be, be quick to listen and slow to anger and just um, try to go through your day with a positive action. That's really what I want to say to everybody is we'll get through this. Well, thanks for that, Chief. Yep. And if anyone wants to reach out to you or the fire department, how can they get a hold of you? Sure, you can call the fire department's uh, office uh, and, uh, and leave me a message. You can send me an email too and I'm sure it'll be on the screen here for that information. So, yeah, anytime I can help, uh, any questions, please call. Very good. Thank you, Chief Rhodes, for your time today and informing our viewers about the City of Janesville's response to COVID-19 at the local level and for your hopeful messages for the community. We commend your leadership, and I know I stand with the city staff and the community in thanking you for your management of COVID-19 locally. And thank you, viewers at home, for tuning in. I hope to take you all on a walking tour downtown next month to check out the amazing progress so far on downtown projects, including the East Side Town Square and the new pedestrian walking bridge. In addition to tuning into this program on a monthly basis, stay connected to the City of Janesville by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also sign up to receive emails with our press releases and other important information, and that's at www.ci.janesville.wi.us slash email lists. And you can subscribe to get emergency alerts from the Janesville Police Department on Nixle. For Park Place Views and the City of Janesville, I'm Molly Nolte. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next month.